yeah, I'm a, I love talking about the sound of perseverance. I'm so so proud of that album, and uh, you know, it's so cool. Relapse. I'm sure you've seen. Did you see the trailer where they? show all the new versions of the vinyl uh, album that they're putting out for that. Yeah, it looks sick, man. It's insane looking. I'm like, oh my God, I need to order that. You know, <laughs> I played on the album, but I want all those versions because it looks freaking awesome. Yeah, Relapse, they seem like they've done quite a bit, you know, with all the death, death material, you know, over the years, which is pretty cool. Oh, they've been doing an amazing job with the death uh, material. And they're working with Chuck's family too, which is great. So they're doing, doing an awesome job. And I, I'm, you know... I'm real happy that that they're putting uh, keep putting Chuck's music out there for the fans. It's awesome. Right? Yeah, they're doing it the right way. So yeah, it was kind of funny because um, there's three hosts on the show, and two of us were are very familiar with Death. Love love the whole discography, and then our other guy, you know, he really hadn't heard anything before, and so it was really cool for him to hear it for the first time in this you know year 2016. And to him, it sounded extremely still fresh and relevant. How does it sound for you kind of listen back to it today whenever you you throw it on? Uh, well, yeah, definitely fresh and relevant. And, uh, you know, it sounds so live to me because and we pretty much did record it live. We recorded on two-inch tape. And, you know, back then there wasn't as much, uh, you know, kind of digital recording. And I'm just... I'm so lucky to have been able to experience what it's like to record on the two inch tape because that's how it was done for so many years up until uh, like 15 years ago or so. And I think there's just such a warmth and, and such a natural live sound to that album because of that. And it really sounds like you're sitting in our rehearsal room listening to us play. And, and that's why I think it holds up so well. And, and I love that, you know, that was a time too, where albums, you, you could have a little bit of a budget where you could take a little bit more time and record on tape and, and kind of, you know, make sure everything was right. You know, we still had to rehearse and, and just be really prepared in the studio, but at the same time, we had a little more time to kind of experiment in the studio too, which is how the painkiller cover came about that. I, what I remember, that was kind of a last minute thing. And I remember, I played the drums along to the actual song, the Judas Priest song on CD, uh, because we hadn't really rehearsed it. And and it was kind of a tough thing to do to play along to the CD and, and to do it all the way through. You know, we, we couldn't really punch in or anything because we were recording on tape. So we, we were allowed a little bit more time to do fun stuff like that back then. Right, right. So, I mean, you, so you guys, were, you, you recorded that with Jim Morris. Yeah, I know it's the production. It, it kind of gives credit to Chuck and Jim. How did that kind of work out in the studio? Um, you know, they work together on Symbolic, and the and the production on Symbolic is just incredible. And uh, they just they were both there for every second of the recording, and uh, you know they were both really easygoing guys and open to each other's ideas. So I think they kind of just worked together. And if one had a suggestion, they were usually always open to it. So. Uh, you know, they, they were just such good friends and had similar senses of humor and, and just were worked so well together that, you know, they, I think they decided they just kind of both were producers on that. So you said you, you guys kind of had some time in the studio to, to write and take your time with things. Was a lot of the writing done in the studio or did you, how did the, what was the writing process like? Like when did it start and, and kind of walk me no, through the process? No, all the writing was... Yeah, I mean, all, the only thing that we kind of took a little bit more time with it, that we hadn't already had ready was the Painkiller song. Everything else was very, very well rehearsed in the studio because a, a lot of those songs, I mean, I had joined the band almost a year before we recorded that, so we had been rehearsing those songs for, you know, I don't know, nine months to a year before we recorded, so we were really well rehearsed, and... That's why it sounds so live and so so good on the album because we just we went in and knew exactly what we were going to do and uh, and everything went real smooth. I think I did the drums in just a couple of days. Wow. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, the only thing that didn't have a riff and just down pat was the the painkiller song, but uh, everything else, yeah, we were told we had already demoed everything as well uh, uh, in Chuck's home studio and. And so we kind of knew, you know, exactly what we were looking for. 
But, uh, you know, we had a little bit more time to get really good tones and things like that. Like we spent a little bit of time getting a, a really good drum sound. And, you know, that's where the, the little extra time in the studio came in handy is just taking, taking the time to make sure everything sounds great so that once we put it on tape, that's pretty much, you know, what it's going to sound like on the album. Yeah, you, you know, know, I mean, it, it was still mixed and everything, but we we made sure we had really good tones going into it. Uh, you know, we were t- we were talking a lot in the episode just about the drumming, and I mean, it, it's every Death album, the drumming is is amazing. There's just something about the sound of perseverance and the drumming that you did on it. It just adds it this whole different flavor to it. And I'm not a drummer, so it's it's always weird for me that I pay such attention to it. But I think it's because to me, it's it's very different than a lot of what was going on in death metal from you know other bands or other drummers. So, what were you aiming for when you were writing this album? Um, I mean, mostly for me, I just wanted to do justice to the other amazing drummers that had played in death before me. You know, I mean, Sean Reiner is a, one of the biggest influences on me as a drummer ever, and same with Gene Hoagland. You know, I've been a fan of Gene since. Dark Angel and I had been a fan of Sean Reinhardt since Cynic. I heard the Cynic demos uh, before he before he joined Dev, and I was a huge fan of his. So I just wanted to do something that carried on that tradition of really good drumming on you know on Death albums, and I wanted to do something that would uh, you know kind of just continue that the fact that Chuck had really good drummers and you know but also put my own sound in there as well. You know, there's a lot of uh, so many different kinds of drummers that I love. And I would say the biggest thing for me, as far as besides being influenced by other metal drummers, like Sean Reiner and Gene Hoagland, I grew up uh, being in the school band and being in the marching band. And and I learned a lot of what I do. I learned from playing in the marching band and actually doing playing snare drum solos, like uh, rudimentary, Kind of, there's a book I had when I was a kid called the National Association of Rudimental Drumming. It was a book of snare drum solos, and I remember I got that when I was in fifth grade. And I, uh, to this day, I still practice to that book. And I would take these snare drum patterns and kind of transcribe them to a drum kit to make weird beats. And so, a lot of my drum sound just comes from my marching band background. What the heck? We're fellow band geeks too. We're all uh, per- percussion and, and marching band and all that, so we can relate a little bit. Oh, nice. Yeah, I mean that. You know, that was the thing. Um, when I turned eighteen, I was going to go to college. I had a drumming a music scholarship for drumming, and that was the thing I lo- was looking most forward to was playing, uh, like at the football games and playing in the marching band and drum corps. But I ended up joining a death metal band called Public Assassin the night before I was supposed to start college. So my path <laughs> kind of changed a little bit. But, you know, in a way, I still I I would have loved to continue that uh, on that path as well, doing a uh, marching band because I freaking love it. Right. On, right. So, you know, when you joined, you know, you said you joined death. You were in death for about a year before you guys started writing the album or you recorded the album. You know, when you started hearing what was going to be on the album. Since you said you were a fan beforehand, I'm sure it sounded a little bit different to you. Were you a little bit surprised at all? Just kind of the direction the album was taking and Chuck was kind of going for? Um, no, not really. I mean, honestly, to me, it, it didn't sound drastically different from, you know, each album Chuck has done has been a progression. So I wasn't surprised that, you know, he was still progressing. And, and you know, every uh, that's what was awesome about Chuck is every death album sounds so much different, you know, like spiritual healing to human. That's a, a, a crazy uh, different sound that he has on human. And then, mm-hmm. you know, each album, he kind of grew a little bit and, and, uh, and changed, which was awesome. He ne- kind of never repeated himself. And uh, so it was cool to hear that progression uh, with Sound of Perseverance. But at the same time, you know, it, Chuck had his sound and, and you could tell it was a Chuck riff when he would play it. And it sounded amazing. So I was just, you know, it was just so amazing as a fan to be able to watch him write riffs and, and to be presented with riffs where he was crazy on the drums right here, you know. He was so cool and so open to me just going nuts. And, you know, at the time I was like 23 years old, so I was ready to just go crazy on the drums because all I was doing at the time was practicing drums all day, every day. 
uh, living in a storage unit. That was pretty much my life. I had a day job, but when I wasn't at my day job as an electrician, I was just playing drums. So I was up for the task of uh, coming up with some crazy drumming stuff when Chuck would ask for it. I remember Spirit Crusher, that that crazy, there's a crazy drum and bass part. And uh, Chuck said, just do something weird right here. You know, and I was like, okay, here we go. And then sure enough, we came up with something. Uh, it's one of the hardest things to play. I remember when we'd play it live, I was terrified I would drop a drumstick because there's no way to recover <laughs> from uh, <laughs> dropping a drumstick during that part because there's so much going on. But luckily, I uh, always was able to hold it together. So you were living in a in like a regular storage unit while you guys were recording? Uh, yeah, yeah, in a metal uh, storage unit, yeah, in uh, wow. Orlando, Winter Park, Florida, right outside Orlando, yeah. yeah. <gasps> That's wild, man. How long were you in that for? Uh, eight years I lived in a storage unit in Orlando. Wow. Um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, but the thing for me at the time, I was young. It was cheap to live there. It was like 150 bucks a month. And I couldn't see paying several hundred bucks a month in rent just to go somewhere to sleep where I could be with my drums and, and sleep and wake up and practice. So, you know, it was kind of a practical thing for me to just live right there where I practice. Right. Right. So, um, you know, when you guys were around that time period, was there any albums you guys were really listening to hard around that time? Like you or Chuck or any of the guys that were kind of just being played a lot? Um, definitely. I remember, you know, there was an album that I freaking loved when it came out. And then for some reason, it's one of those, you know, once in a while you'll kind of rediscover an album. And you'll be like, why did I ever stop listening to this? And then one day Chuck was cranking it up in his car and it was uh, Halloween Keeper of the Seven Keys Part 2. And I was like, man, I, I forgot how amazing of an album that is because I had it on cassette when it came out. And then uh, Chuck kind of reintroduced me to it. So we listened to a lot of Hall Halloween Keeper of the Seven Keys Part 2, uh, a lot of Watchtower Control and Resistance. Chuck and I both loved that, that album. And uh, Chuck was a huge Watchtower fan. He even flew to Texas to see him when they got back together in like the year 2000. And uh, we're listening to... A lot of, uh, you know, what was new at the time was Children of Bodom had them out, an album out that I remember Chuck and I listened to a lot. Uh, I think it was their first album from 97. And then uh, Hammerfall came, around, came out right around that time. And I remember Chuck and I listened to a lot of Hammerfall and a lot of Gamma Ray, too. So, yeah, just uh, there was so much cool music coming out at the time. And, uh, and Chuck and I were always open. And, you know, Shannon and Scott as well. But Shannon and Scott lived kind of over on the coast, so Chuck and I would hang out even when we wouldn't weren't practicing. We'd still hang out together because I lived near Chuck in Orlando, so uh, we would just get together and listen to vinyl and listen to metal. There, I remember there's a band called Sortilege from France that I think to this day nobody besides Chuck I've ever heard really kind of talk about them, and I thought it was so cool that Chuck knew this crazy rare band that nobody had heard of. And <laughs> once in a while I'll mention that band to somebody, and they they can't believe I know who it is and it's all thanks to chuck oh and uh riot we listened to a lot of riot the, uh, riot put out an album called the nishmore in uh like 97 98 and i remember chuck and i listened to that album nonstop. and i actually even listen to that album today i still freaking love that album <laughs> 